So, well, I have this presentation on the research question. We're going to go into a lot of details on how the research question works, how it functions in the research, and also what are the different aspects of the question. And we're going to look at a ton of different questions and kind of um, uh, analyze them and see what's working, what's not working. And hopefully with each of these, it will help give you some ideas, some inspiration. You might be able to uh, discover some formulas that might work for your own research topic. So before we start, um, uh, let's review a couple of main points which are related to practice-based research. So I, we always call it artistic research, but it's, it's sort of a broader term would be practice-based practice research. So. In this case, you ask an artistic question and you answer it by making art, in your case, music, right? So this is why I'm asking you already to send me recordings and, uh, and how I can see how it's not always been easy for everybody because the topic is far away from the recording. And then when you make this recording, it, it, it kind of, slingers your your topic right back into to some relevancy for your practice um when you're researching you're reflecting on your art and you're also making it explicit number one for yourself so what am i doing how am i singing on the piano what how am i balancing the left and right hand but also you're gonna you're gonna disseminate this. You're gonna you're gonna uh, you're gonna write it down. You're gonna make videos, and you're gonna explain it to me and to your mentor and your teacher and everyone else who reads it. So that's um, that's a uh, an essential facet of artistic research. Next, uh, research comes from your musical practice and flows back into it. So. Uh, an example I was just talking with Christoph, so he was thinking about maybe researching uh, singing in piano, or I suggested it from your topic. So in that, in that example, let's say he listens to, uh, so he's got a topic about how do I make the piano sing. First he has to define what that is, because the piano does not sing, so we'd have to understand what that means. But then let's say he takes a recording of uh, Polini and then, and then he reenacts how he, you know, maybe he takes a few bars, he learns to play it like that. How does he sing? And then he has learned something new about that possibility, which then he incorporates into some other pieces playing. So there's this kind of circular movement all the time of like you have, in this case, you have a topic in which you then you go study, and then that then feeds back into your playing. And the topic came from your playing, you learned information, and then that went back into the playing. So there's this constant circular motion between uh, uh, departing from your practice through some questions and ideas and methods, and then gaining that information, and then that coming back into your practice. And that's that, that's that development research process. Okay, next point uh, of this practice-based research, the results need to be noticeable in your performance. So, and this is why we're making these recordings now, is we're, we're, we're capturing the current state of your art. And then you're gonna do all this research over the next year and a half, and then you're gonna make a new recording, and we're gonna be able to see the two the difference between the two, and you're gonna explain it. So it's gonna be noticeable. Um, sometimes we say measurable, but I, that's a little bit scientific. You know, it's a little bit more like quantifying things with numbers. But you know, for some of the researches, you might actually measure some things and create some numbers. Like if you're talking about the way different materials resonate or something. And if you have, a, a uh, access to some scientific methods to do that could be interesting. But in general, we talk more about noticeable, observable instead of measurable. But the, 
the concept is the same. Um, and then your goal, which is becoming a better, more interesting, or more independent artist, that's your goal. That's not your research topic. So we are all have that goal to, uh, to become deeper artists, uh, more interesting, more creative, more expressive. Um, and every day we move towards that goal and we never, every day we never get to the end, right? So until the day we die, right? There's that, that famous story of Rostopovich and he's like 85, 90 years old, and practicing two, three hours a day. Mr. Rostopovich, you are one of the most celebrated, accomplished cellists in the history of the cello. And here you are practicing every day. And he says, yeah, but I, I think I'm making progress. Right? So it somehow shows. Boy, you guys are really like unstoppable with uh, the emotion. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's look at some no-go topics. Uh, it's a little bit, uh, ex I put it a little extremely here, but uh, uh, I am open, like I said, I'm trying not to say no to any topic, but we, some topics are gonna be difficult to fit in this concept of artistic research, practice-based research. So, so for example, if you just wanna do musicology and study, you know, do an analysis of different scores and then come to some conclusions, then that's not what we're doing. If you're talking about how I make uh, the music of Rachmaninoff and Bach sing on piano, then you might do an analysis of those two scores and then figure out what kind of techniques you can do to make them sing and then make recordings. So again, we will do a lot of musicology for your research, but it's not the essence of the research. It's just going to be the gathering of information and analysis, generating of information in order to uh, influence your practice. Uh, research for the arts is also something we're not doing. If you want to just build a really great guitar or something, uh, that's that's not what we're doing. But if you have if you have a, a an idea of a certain sound you're trying to get, and you need to build a guitar to get to that sound, do it. If you you know if you're a good computer programmer and you can make um, uh, uh, digital effects in like Logic or whatever uh, for other musicians, that's also not what we're doing. But if you, again, if you're trying to get a certain sound and you need to go in and do some programming, then, uh, then you could do that. And then that digital effects, which you create, could also be for other artists. So that you could do research for the arts, but again, that's not the main the main goal here in the main process. Uh, of course, research that has no relevance for you as a performer, also not doing that. So that's a sort of obvious question, but sometimes you can be helpful to ask that. Therapy, getting rid of problems, also not trying to uh, uh, focus our research around that. Um, you may have issues we all have issues. We all have, you know, uh, we, also, we all have physical and mental issues that we're working on all the time in our being musicians. And, um, you know, issues like stage fright, mental imagery, uh, Alexander technique, sports medicine, all these different topics which are related to maybe problems we might want to be solving. Um, by all means, look into those and do them, but don't focus your research around that. So usually that comes from that, that uh, starting point where you like, oh, I have this issue I wanna solve while I'm here in my master's and I also need to do a research. So let's kill two birds with one stone. I'm all for that, killing multiple birds with one stone, not killing birds, but you know, achieving more things with one. But we want to uh, we want to have the the essence of the research always to be artistic in nature, um, and there are a lot of reasons for that, right? If you if you say uh, like uh, I don't concentrate well when I perform, 
and then we we put that through this this video system right so then you you, you show me a video from today where I say, look, I'm not concentrating, I'm missing notes, and I'm not focused, I'm not singing and stuff. And then we do all the research, you read all the literature, you do the exercises, and then a year and a half later, you say, listen, look at this recording, I'm totally concentrating. So everything I did must have worked. Um, the problem is, is that's in the, in the head, right? And we also know, if you at all look at any neuroscientific literature, the brain is super complex, and, uh, and it's... Uh, there are all kinds of theories and knowledge about how it works, but every for every theory that says one thing, there's another theory that says a different thing, and so it's it's um, there's 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 no reliability about how it is. But if you if you say, listen, this is how you do vibrato, and I'm doing a research into vibrato, and here how I do it now. I did all this research and experimentation, and I have a new approach, <coughs> and you can explain exactly how that works. Well, it's really clear. Just it just works as a sort of research method. So um, yeah. Interesting. Um, so if you have a also a correct topic, and say in you know what we were talking about making the piano sing, if you were then in the process of trying to figure out how do I do that, look at Alexander Technique or have coincidentally Alexander Technique classes which you find help. You could incorporate. That, Absolutely, a hundred percent yes, and that that's exactly the way. If, if doing Alexander Technique is important for you or relevant for you, do it and then tie it in as one of the influences or one of the things, one of the facets of your research. And then you say, well, you know, I, I learned Alexander Technique and then when I sit with a correct spine position, it really helps me get an artic like a sort of quick articulation, which I couldn't get when I was slouching. And and then you could kind of show that, I, then it works great as a sort of uh, a method, as one of the facets of the research. But then the, 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 the focus of the research is not how does Alexander make you sing on, Alexander's thinking make you sing on the piano, because that's really multifaceted. Or, and it's not like, how can I learn to sit with correct position, right? So, uh, um, yeah. Okay, and then lastly, purely main subject topics. So, of course, you guys all have your teachers' main subject, and you teach, you know, in collaboration with them. You're learning all kinds of new things and having all kinds of new pieces you're working on. That's not your research topic. So, if you're learning orchestral excerpts for your teacher because you want to get a job, that doesn't necessarily mean you should research that. You just you know, of course, you're practicing it and learning it. If you want to research orchestral excerpts, you have to go much, much, much deeper into it. Any other questions about these these ideas for now? Well, yeah. Could you clarify maybe a bit about um, what you said that you said in the last one about the ears and the big brain? You know, so that you can't know that it's involved in our brain process and stuff. Because I feel like last week we talked, like many people talked about different topics that could kind of fit into that in a way. Yeah. Because they involve some kind of investigation that is, or because the nature of this research is internal, there's a lot of stuff that we're going to be assuming, kind of. So based on cause and effect, but not actually looking into it scientifically. Well, I mean, like on, uh, as an example, like the concentration one, It's like, well, maybe you got a good night's sleep <clears throat> on the second recording. Maybe you had some coffee beforehand or you didn't have coffee. You know, there's so many different aspects to like concentration and performance. And um, to do that kind of research, you need like millions of euros and huge numbers of people and control groups and all that stuff to maybe try to draw some link between coffee or sleep and concentration and you know and there will always be questions um so that's not practical for us <laughs> and, and we're not scientists so that's like a sort of medical scientific research um but when you when you put a research into you know how can i uh incorporate david bowie's uh, interdisciplinarity into my own 
art form, well, then we can look at how he's combining costumes and music and personas, generate some theory, and then and then say, well, this is where I am, and these are my ideas, and then I'm going to take that theory, and I'm going to see what it generates in my work, right? So then that kind of really practical uh, research, just it's really clear, and we, we, we get it, and we don't get into these mysterious, the, the, you know, anything with the brain gets so mysterious. And you're right, of course, there is an internal aspect of it, of all the research, and um, and we're through reflection. We're trying to make that these internal processes and uh, uh, and and perspectives explicit. Um, but it's not studied in a, in that kind of scientific way. Yeah. So sometimes, if you just write down, or yeah, you just note how you feel compared to how you felt before you applied something that also worked in a research sense. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I want you guys to talk about your thoughts, your feelings, your opinions. Uh, all of that stuff should be in there, your perspectives. It's it, the, the, the progress of the research, it, it, it's all based on what you think, right? And so if you study a recording of Polini, if you read some article on vibrato, if you do an analysis of the piece, that information has to, 100% of that information has to be related to your research and you have to say what you think about it. So there's no, there's no information which is outside of your, your, um, your embodied cognition, right? Which is your, your, your mind and your body and so what do you what do you what do you think about that so so there's that reflection of what you think also how it's relevant and then there's the the making explicit of what it, what you've done with that for your your research topic so um <clears throat> So if you say, you know, I, I, I listened to this piece of music and I thought it was too fast. Um, and then you could start to try to figure out why it's too fast. So it starts with maybe a, a reaction and the feeling. And then you could say, well, you know, I think that the, the harmonic speed was, was uh, you know, there's much more meaning in those, the harmonic changes where when you play it at that speed, it goes too fast, right? And then, and then you could say, here I am playing it at a slower speed. And you can experience how each chord has a bigger effect. I'm making this up, but this is the idea how it starts from feelings and then works its way into more concrete specifics. Okay. A research question is a clear, focused, concise, and complex question that exactly defines what you're going to research. The research question provides a focus and an anchor to guide you through the research and writing process. So this is why we're spending a lot of time on this question because it's really an effective tool to keep your research focused. I mean, as you know, like we wake up in the morning and we feel like playing this piece or we feel like doing these exercise, you know, these scales or we don't, we feel like playing a different, you know, we are every day we're a different person and we're going around, we're learning things, we're getting new ideas and there's like a, a, a thousand different things bouncing around in our heads all the time. And, uh, um, and they're all really interesting and most of them are like huge questions. So then like, hey, great, let's put a research into that and, and, and go deeper. Um, and then when you put that into a question, then you have that. And that question becomes a sort of uh, a constitution, becomes a, 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 an anchor, which you come back to periodically in your research or maybe every day. And, and then that helps you take decisions, literally. So of all these thousand things, only 150 of them are relevant for your research. So 
the other 850 still be busy with those because they're interesting, but don't feel like you have to include them in your research. So this is why we have the question, is it, it, uh, it helps you anchor it. And as we will see, the question can also evolve as the research evolves. You might say, well, I thought I was researching on one thing, but actually it's, it's, uh, it's something else. Um, uh, like maybe I thought I was researching how to sing on the piano, but actually I'm, I'm really focused on the different applications of articulation and singing is one of them. Maybe playing rhythmic could be another, right? So there's a, a you always start the research with one kind of uh, impulse hook. What is that? Um, what? Angle. What? Angle. Angle? Thank you. You start from one angle, and as you do the research, you might find, okay, it's a slightly different angle, or it's a deeper uh, facet of that angle, so it gets reinterpreted. Um, so the research, the research question can change, but when you, as you start to uh, do the writing and do your methodology, you keep coming back to that research question. Um, usually, when you've done, written the whole essay or paper, you usually go back and then you, you look at your question one more time and make sure it fits the research you've done. So there is a little bit of give and take, uh, exchange of, of direction between the research and the question, but but the question in general really fu uh, functions as a, uh, uh, as, to, f as, to, as a focuser to keep you on track. For others, the research question helps them understand what you're researching. So as you will notice, I, every time I talk to one of you, the first thing I ask is, what's your question? And then, uh, and then I'm gonna be like, ah, oh yeah, that one. And then, and then I know. And then we can talk about all the specifics. So, but if I don't know the question, then I don't know. Like some people sent me some videos of them playing without the question. And it's great to see you play, but I don't know what we're looking at without that question. So we always need to have that context. Um, and you should be telling everybody, tell your teacher for sure, tell your colleagues, your friends, when you're sitting in the canteen, talk about your research question. Tell your mom, tell your dad, you know, and, and see what they say. So I'm sure uh, uh, they might have all kinds of interesting things to say. And if they have no idea about music, as my parents didn't, it was always really helpful for me to try to explain what I was doing in music for them, because, to them, because then I, uh, I, I understood it clearer for myself. And I was, if I could explain it to the lay person, then... Uh, then it, uh, uh, it was clearer for me. Okay, research questions should be, and this is a little bit of repeat, but I have a list here, so let's go through it. They should be practice-based and have practical outcomes. They're about you and your artistic practice. The research questions should contribute to your knowledge, skills, understanding, and also the the knowledge, skills, and understanding for others. <coughs> the question should neither be too broad or too narrow. Aim for two years. So, uh, if you, you know, what tempo should I take the first movement of the sonata? That's not a research of two years. That's maybe a research of one or two weeks of like looking at recordings and trying it out and discussing it with your teacher. Uh, but um, uh, choosing Tempi for Beethoven's, all of Beethoven's sonatas is then far too big for two years. That's maybe a PhD or, 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 or even more collaborative uh, project. So you want to think about what is, what is the question that is going to be deep, complex, take a lot of work, but you still feel like you can answer it at the end of these two years. So, and it's a, it's a technical thing. We can look at it. Sometimes I'll have feedback on it, but you also need to know for yourself uh, intuitively how that feels. Okay. The research question should be manageable. So there should be sources 
we should be able to find sources. Uh, you know, if you were traveling in Mongolia and you met some Mongolian hurdy-gurdy player, which probably doesn't exist, and then you came back here and you decided to do your research on him or her and there's no recordings and nobody knows them and but you know that wouldn't be a great research topic because you can't find any information um, uh, and your methods need to be practically possible so so that's also one of the reasons why the the scientific research or medical research is difficult if we need to have if we need to study you know 500 people how are we going to do that uh, we, some people talk about doing surveys for the audience. That's also can be tricky. Sometimes it can be useful for your research. So we need to really be clear about what the purpose of that is and realistic. But um, uh, uh, it can also be practically difficult. You had a question? Yeah, I could see contributing to your knowledge, skills, understanding, and also for others. And I was just thinking, how does that comply with not being allowed to do a research for the arts? Uh, well, research for the arts would also contribute to your knowledge, made, well, not necessarily your skills, right? Because it's not uh, in your practice. But certainly it would contribute to your knowledge and understanding and also for others, like musicology. So it, it's not like every one of these points, they all come together, they all yeah, yeah. Uh, go together. So, I'm but, just trying to understand like there is certain ingredients in the research and to a certain extent, I, I get a feeling like to a certain extent you can go that way and then you have to kind of... Yeah. Well, that's right. It, that's right. It uh, you can travel a bit ways, and then you run in with some facets. You can you can go quite far, but then you run into problems with other facets. So we have a lot of different things we're balancing here yeah, with. Yeah, sure. But um, uh, certainly, uh, by the end of your artistic research, you will have a lot of knowledge about how your practice and your vision works, and your skills, how to uh, practically. Uh, do that. Um, the question should be researchable. So, uh, um, you want to avoid extremely abstract or broad terms. Usually, the goals are more like that. How do I become a better musician? Um, but uh, if you were to say, uh, uh, how can I play more musical? that would be kind of abstract. Like you would have to start out by trying to define what musical is, and that I think would be really tricky, right? Whereas if you say, how can I, how can I use a vibrato and articulation to, uh, to uh, be more expressive in uh, Mozart violin sonatas, then okay, we've got, you still have to figure out what define what expressivity is, but probably that's a little bit more definable than musicality. And we have some techniques, vibrato and articulation. Okay, uh, the research question should be clear, should be understandable to you and to others with clearly defined concepts. So everyone in your field should know exactly what they mean. So no obscure words or um, uh, vague terms. Uh, it, we just try to keep it clear, relatively um, uh, uh, uncomplex language. Um, needs to be focused, right? So when we're talking about the, the time frame, uh, and, and we, we could talk about this when we talk about, but usually there Often the really nice questions, they take two concepts and then they tie them together. Like how can I study uh, flute materials and projection, right? So then we've got different wood 
platinum or gold or silver of the way you build a flute, and we have this concept of projection. So then the way the sound goes into the space. So then we've got these, you, you take these two concepts, you put them together, and then that makes for a really nice, you know, th there you have kind of have one thing which is quite limited, like projection, and then materials is maybe a little bit more open. So then it's the balancing of, of two concepts. I've seen that really often, and those make for really uh, clear questions. And they also limit the scope of the research. Uh, your questions should be concise, so don't write a story. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to talk a lot about that in the coming uh, slides. Uh, and it should be complex. There should be a challenge, and that should be reflected in the research question. So if you can answer your question with a yes or no, or just do it, then uh, that's not a good question. It should require research and analysis. Okay. Uh, elements of a research question. Number one, the research question should contain <coughs> your practice and yourself. So here's a, here's a student I have. He's, he's researching, how can I create my interpretation of Kaya Sariajo's Duft through developing a visual media performance. So Duft is a solo clarinet piece. Uh, so he's playing this piece and um, he wants to create his interpretation and develop a visual media performance. So what do we have? We have himself, it's a how can I? How can I create my interpretation? It's not, um, how can uh, Sariajo's Duft be interpreted in a visual media performance, right? That's, that's uh, uh, it's not tied to him. How can that be done? Or how can one do that? No, it's how can I create? So, and what that means is that immediately he has to start explaining all his perspectives, ideas, and decisions. And so that's, and that's what we want with artistic research. We want the individual perspective, as I was saying. So uh, sometimes you don't need to say, how can I? You can just talk about, you know, like, um, like my compositions or in my interpretation. So we can, we can see, I've seen that sometimes. Um, avoid putting the methods in your question. How can I integrate Keith Jarrett's improvised language from his solo concerts into a fully improvised concert? So with this student, uh, we were talking about this. So this is a, a classical pianist and uh, he was really in interested in how Keith Jarrett improvises full concerts. If you don't know, Keith Jarrett is a, was, is a pianist and uh, he would just get up and then improvise for an hour and a half, two hours, and uh, that was a full concert. So this student, when he, uh, for his research, the first, what he did is he did it in cycles. So he, and we could call those like facets. So he, he took three different facets of the research. And this is really typical, and I would strongly like to suggest that you could think of your research like that too, in cycles. And for the first cycle, what he did <clears throat> is he looked at uh, Keith Jarrett's voicings and uh, in the way he was uh, using harmonies, something like that. So he did an analysis of part of the recording uh, by the way, I will send you this PowerPoint so you can uh, see it. You don't have to cover. But so the first cycle is he looked at voicings and harmonies uh, and like ryth rhythmic patterns, and then he analyzed that. He had a first recording. He had a second recording of his own improvisations where he showed how that worked. And then after that, he thought, okay, this is really interesting, and um, I'm going to look at Keith Jarrett's contrapuntal improvisations because he would do that. So he analyzed that and he also analyzed some contrapuntal theory 
And then he developed a number of exercises where you have, you improvise the one note, like, like you improvise one note each at the same time in one hand, and then two notes in one hand, and one note in the other hand, and then three notes. He also developed exercises of imitation between the two hands. So basically he, he took some contrapuntal techniques and developed some exercises to be able to learn those. Okay, that was the second cycle we could call. And then for the, th and after he had done those two, he thought, oh, I could go into, you know, some other aspect of Keith Jarrett's specific of his playing. And then we thought, you know what, what's more interesting is to, oh no, this is why he wanted to look at the way Keith Jarrett was using Debussy and Bach in his playing, right? So, because you can kind of hear the classical, uh, influences in his improvisations you say oh that that sounds a little bit like um like Bach there and uh, <coughs> so he wanted to kind of do a sort of musicological analysis tying two together and um but we we switched that into in a way a much more interesting topic which was to first by looking at the way Keith Jarrett uses Bach and uh and, and Debussy in his playing and then for the student to look at the classical pieces that he was playing. And that was then Rachmaninoff and Mozart, for example. And then analyze those two styles in a general way and develop exercises for him to be able to improvise in those styles. So in a way, the, 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 the process that Keith Jarrett took of like using all the classical music he had played and integrating that into his uh, into his improvisations, we did exactly the same with the student, but then not with Keith Jarrett's improv uh, influences, but with his own influences. So then that also led to him creating more his own style of improvisation based on his, uh, his motivations and history. So, so we had these three different cycles to his, uh, uh, to his, research and none of them were mentioned in the research question. So the question was how can I integrate Keith Jarrett's improvised language from his solo concerts into a fully, that's where he started with. And then on the basis of that question, we, we broke it up into small facets and then which were manageable and then worked on it. And because those facets, those cycles were in a, in a serial nature, you just start with one, which you think you can do. So if, you're, if your topic is about, you know, how can I uh, take uh, David Bowie's songwriting and make my own songs, you might want to start by looking at his harmonies. And then you just, you analyze all of his harmon harmonic approaches and, and, and your own, and you make a couple of pieces which integrate his harmonies. And then, the second one might be, you know, the incorporation of lyrics and the way he makes his lyrics. And then, then you would, you would uh, write songs or look at the way you make lyrics and then create some new songs which are influenced by his theory. And then the last one might be the integration of harmony, lyrics, and costumes and making completely new pieces in your own style. So then, but but it might be something different and you don't know that until you've gone through the first couple cycles. So I'm, I'm integrating this whole research cycle concept into this, but I, 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 we haven't done that here till now. And I think it's a really effective process to, to break your research up. Okay. Um, so you create one main research question which captures the core of the research and then the sub-questions can function to focus your methodology. So in this Keith Jarrett example, the sub-questions were how, um, how can I uh, take his uh, approach to uh, uh, voicings in my music? Um, uh, how can I create contrapuntal exercises for uh, improvisation? And the last one was like, how can I um, uh, look at uh, my uh, the pieces that I've played and integrate that into my um, my playing. Okay, and lastly, 
Um, last element for your research question, leave out your goal. So it's not how can I uh, integrate Keith Jarrett's language into improvised concerts in order to become an interesting improviser? No. It's just it, because the goal, like I said, is something you never achieve. It's something you're always working for. You just keep going up towards that goal. Whereas the question, you want to answer that question with a big fat period uh, at the end of your research. Yeah, Noah. And when there's something in it like in order to stretch boundaries as an artist. Yeah, see, that's a, well, see, that's a goal, huh? Yeah. That how, also, you, you also want to look at it this way. Everything in your research question needs to be researchable. Um, so, okay, well, stretching boundaries is already, we'd have to define what that is, and then you'd have to show, okay, these are my boundaries now, and these are my boundaries later, and were they stretched, or were they expanded, you know, it, it gets really complicated. And if it's about the audience, for example, uh, to factor the visibility of my work to the audience, because I'm... What was the word, to what? Uh, Affect predictability. Of my work for the oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> then it's not questionable. Uh, you would have to interview the audience before the concert. What is she gonna play? Yeah, and somehow they'd have to pre say what they're predicting. That's complicated. We'd have, that I, opens I all kinds of. Yeah. That it was, and, and then it's, yeah, that's pretty obvious. Really. Okay. Like, 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 elements of surprise. I'm bringing back to my advice. Perfect. How can I, how can I incorporate su more su surprise in my music? Yeah, so that's you could say that, and so then you could try to define what that means. And so then you might talk about parameters and amounts of change. I just make this thought, and then I want to hear what you want to say. And so, and then what you would do is you would break that surprise up into a technique, which then you would study and incorporate into your, into your art. Whereas the way the, the, the way the experience, the audience experiences that in relation to predictability or, or, or surprise, certainly you could still do your survey to uh, ask them and that might help you take some decisions. But um, but it's a different. It would be different than if you said, "Okay, I'm going to try to create the ultimate piece, which <coughs> creates the most amount of surprise for the audience." Because then you would have to study the audience, and and as we know, if we ask a hundred people, you know, we'll get, uh, you know, what did you think? Then they'll come with a hundred different answers. Yeah, of course, but it's also not my topic. It's just something. Yeah. So we just talked about the two elements. Yeah. Ah, okay, like that. Well, let's work on it. it, yeah. it you know, these things, uh, as we start to talk through the specifics of how you would research it, you start to figure out what works and what doesn't work, or what's really complicated or not. Is that a question? Yeah. <laughs> so. What do you mean when you say don't incorporate your goal into the question? Well, in a sense, the research question, the goal is the goal, right? Yeah, okay. I understand. Yeah, you're, yeah the, the word goal can have many different meanings, and that's absolutely one of them. But in this case, we could talk about, you know, what is your, your, your goal to come to, the, you know, these kind of bigger long-term goals of what we are trying to achieve as artists. And they, uh, they're really important for us to triangulate our research. So if I'm trying to, you know, become a, a um, yeah, a more, yeah, there are usually these things like become a better artist or have better technique or be more expressive 
or be more interesting or creative. You know, these are these these are the kind of goals I'm, I mean when I say goals. And so it's more about your daily flow research. Yeah. It should be manageable. Yeah. Instead of because I feel like if I look at the big picture, there's still goals that are set. Well, yeah, his goal is to create an interpretation of that piece, yeah. right? It's a different thing to me because it's manageable. It's okay to put it. Well, no, I'm what I'm trying to. I mean. What I'm trying to, I, I mean, let's not get too hung up on it, but I'm trying to say that that's the question and then the, the, the definition of goal of more of these things that you, we are working towards our whole lives. Okay. So uh, that's the way I look at it. Um, so I have a bunch of research questions, but should we dive into those or should we take a little break? Feels like it to me too. Let's do that. Uh, it's ten to eleven. We go until twelve thirty. So we take like fifteen minutes. It's okay. Okay, great guys.